Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Too Opinionated, or it's a big one for me. You know I'm a Trek fan. I've got actor John Billingsley with me, so welcome, John. One of the most opinionated people you will ever meet. In fact, you probably won't listen past the seven-minute mark, so. That's what we want. Very few people make it past the seven-minute mark, I find. Yeah, that you know that's really true. That's really true. If if I was smart, we would just do many episodes, five minutes or less. We keep we keep the. You just kind of like lead people to the waters with anodyne commentary, and then around the fifteen minute mark, suddenly the trap springs shut, and that's when people start getting opinionated. That's right. That's exactly right. Right out of the gate. Go ahead. Ask me for my opinion. I'll tell you. Give ask ask me for my opinion on anything. John, what's I'm your opinion? It. <laughs> that's an old great song. Whatever it is, I'm against it. You know that song? That's that's terrific. If, From a little, no, a little, that's a, a bonus known, to have you singing on here. A little known musical um, about politics back in the 20s. One of my favorite songs. Yeah. Whatever it is, I'm against it. Oh, I, what am I talking about? No, that was actually from the Marx Brothers movie. That was, uh, that was uh, Horse Feathers, I think. Oh, Horse Feathers. Yeah. Okay, all right. Now you're talking more of my language. Yeah. Although I, I'm a big musical fan. This was a mu- this is mu- an obscure musical in which uh, they they nominate somebody ridiculous to run for president, and uh, I, I'm I'm going to space on it, and they'll probably come to me after this interview is over, and I'll be I'll be like, oh, I wish I remembered it. But yeah, so sort of- so so based in fiction is what you're saying. Yes. And was it Horse Feathers? What was the one? What what was the one where it was a mythical country? It was it was uh, where they were the. Uh, the Marx Brothers were the leaders of a mythical country. With Groucho was the president. Whatever it is, I'm against it. Be an oh, animal, a mineral, la, 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 da, 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 whatever it is, I'm against it. Anyway, that's my opinion. Turner's president. It goes over. Okay. Well, well, it's it. That's all I needed. That's all I wanted. Well, needed. Yeah. That's, that's exactly yeah. what I wanted. Yeah, Tur- somebody, just, like, one of the movie channels is probably still showing that. We you probably can just still watch. record all the questions and just play me saying I'm against it over and over and over again and, and keep the interview very truncated. I actually yeah. love that. Yeah. I'm probably stopping you that. from actually doing a legitimate introduction, aren't I? I'm bad about that. No, 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 not at all. Actually, you've given me the clip because now I can just, too opinionated. I'm against it. There you go. And then we're all set. No, it's, this is such a it's such a, a big interview for me. I'm... I, so thankful that you agreed to do this. You know, welcome My pleasure. To yeah, such a such a fan of yours, and have been for for a long time. You've been at this for a little while. I have been active. Did you come see my fifth grade play? How long have you been a fan of mine? Oh have you been gosh. Did you see Scrooge? I, in the, you in know, the well, I, was that the play? Was, was it Scrooge? Scrooge. It was oh, a Christmas oh. Carol. Yes, I moved to uh, Connecticut from a small southern town, and I had I had talk like this. And so the uh, the, the more they tried to beat the accent out of me, but I, I I so I was not popular, but I was I was a, always a reader. So yes. when they they had uh, mandatory, believe it or not, school auditions for the play for the school play, and I was the only one who could read off the page with any degree of enthusiasm, much less you know clarity. And so I got cast <laughs> So for some brief shining moment. I was suddenly popular. It lasted for you know the duration of the of the of the process. I was completely unpopular as soon as the play was over, but it, it that's what whet my appetite for the theater. It yeah. was purely about oh, this is where popularity lies, and then I got to actually kind of love the work in its own right. So yes, I've been doing it for a long time. Well, that would see that would have been my question anyway. Was how you got started. I anticipate people's questions and I, I right. answer them before they ask. Yes. Yeah. I, I also was in a fifth grade play, Babes in Toyland. That's how it was for a fifth grade I, play. Yeah, I was uh, mate number two, which oh. which was actually the the more sought the after mate. role. That's the better mate. I'd much better It is be the better mate. Guy. Yeah, yeah. Your sidekick is better than, you know, like lead guy. Yeah, well, so so the first mate, he didn't have many lines, but the second mate actually had to have a pirate accent. And back then for some reason, I, I had a little bit of a pirate accent, so I got the role. You still have a little bit of a pirate accent, actually. I think. Oh, I, well, thank you so much. I, I, well, if you want to take that as a compliment, sure. What the hell? Yeah. No, I'll I take that. Oh, I'll yeah. take that. That was the beginning and the end of of my acting work. Really? Let, let's hear you say a vasty swabby. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hear. Let's hear that. Let's hear like this. A vasty swabby. 
Not bad, not bad, not bad. Nah, it's not too good. I got to practice. I got to yeah, practice. It's, 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 no actually, it's not it's, like, you know, so you got to like, like commit, commit, you know, I gotta commit. Hey, yeah. swabby. you got to get Ooh. that swabby out of the way. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Like that. that swabby standing right between you and the bar cart. I have this feeling it's been too long. That was, you know, 40 years ago, but my guess is that it was something I could do R well. That would be my uh, guess. That's probably uh, why I got the role. Yeah. You got to probably, I probably didn't gotta, even have any lines. You got to screw up your eye and kind of curl your mouth. Yeah. You know, a lot of, a lot of people comment. They think I've had a stroke. It's a strange thing I see now on, on that line. And <laughs> people say, what's up with Billingsley? A corner of his mouth is always kind of like, you know, like he's, he doesn't move. They have various uh, medical diagnoses, and there are people who say he had a stroke. Like they know, like it's like, oh yeah, he had a stroke. It happened in, uh, yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I, 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 it didn't. I didn't have a stroke. I think it's just because I spent many years talking like a pirate, and so it fucked up my mouth. And I uh, love that. Yeah, I love it. That, yeah, that, it's it's called pirate mouth. A lot of pirates get it. <laughs> yeah. So I actually, the first time I remember seeing you on on camera was the X-Files. You were like, okay. you were like the extra gunman. Oh, I was, uh, yes, that's right. I was pretending to be a nerd so I could infiltrate the lone gunman. Yeah. And, and that click generally, but in fact, I was a, uh, I was a hired killer. Yes. I know, it's back worked. when I played hired killers, now I, now I've, I've still play psychopaths, but now I'm more desk bound. Although I had heard that you were in uh, an episode of Northern Exposure, which I watched, but I, I don't remember that. I was. I was. Uh, I don't remember what season I played. Uh, the doctor has left town and the nurse is in charge. If you remember, I can't remember her name. She was an incredibly stoic, unflappable uh, Native American woman. Yes, uh, but I don't I, recall I, her name I, either. I, yeah, I don't either. I came in with a mild ailment and she, uh, she, t she told me I was going to die. I was like, what, what, what? Because <laughs> you're going to die. And I, I had taken off my shirt and I was clutching my shirt to my chest. And yes, uh, very good. Yeah. Yeah. I've been in some I've been in some things that are that are, are shockingly bad that uh, I'm always interested when people uncover them. Usually fans. It's like, hey, guess what I found? It's like, uh oh, you've been in so many things, though. And a lot of doctors, a lot of doctors. A lot of doctors, a lot of child molesters, some doctors who are child molesters. It's a, it's a strange oeuvre, my oeuvre. Yeah, you got to do a serial killer. That's uh, many serial killers. Many. That's, serial uh, you've killers. had some range. Yeah, yeah, and some nice guys. Doctor Flocks, it was nice that Doctor Flocks actually probably closer to my temperament and disposition than any part I've ever played. He was a, a sort of a you know a easily amused, curious soul who generally got along with folks and. Um, I, I I quite liked playing Doctor Flox. Didn't care for the makeup, but I quite liked that character. You were my favorite character on Enterprise. Oh well, thank you. I always like that to be said around some of the other actors. I'm sorry that they yeah. couldn't be there to hear you say that. But oh yeah, well it's going to be out there. They're oh, going to see you, it. Do you prefer me to Bob Picardo? That's really the most important thing. Yes, I do, <laughs> and I'm a big fan of his. Hey Bob, you watching this? <laughs> <laughs> he sent me I'm, I'm friends with bob he's such a good guy but he sent me one day he always tweaks me he sent me this like hey john i just thought you might like to see the result of this recent internet poll that ranked me as the favorite doctor and you as the least favorite doctor it's like oh, oh, unfair unfair anything else it's a push poll you know those don't count i'm uh i'm on the side to, or team flocks Ah, good for you. Good yeah. for you. I know you're not just saying that, but uh, well, you know, you know, when I I'm, I remember when the show first came out and fans were all torn up because they thought you were going to be very similar to Neelix. Oh yes, and, I remember that too. And I, right. I never watched Voyager, so it was like, who? What is this Neelix of which you speak? Yeah, and but it, but you were not. You Thank you uh, very quickly claimed uh, uh, the role as your own. And, I, and I love it, Ethan too. Actually, I get confused. I get confused with Ethan quite a bit. People come up to me and said, "Oh my God, I loved you as a music." Ah. Like, no, you know, us us fat multi pronged aliens all get confused for each other. Hey, I sent him. I sent him a note to to come on the show, and he didn't do it. So you you I'm beat a, I'm, me. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the biggest slut in Star Trek. Anybody. <laughs> um, I can go to the John Billingsley will go to the opening of an envelope if you promise him just, a martini. 
And he didn't even promise me a martini. But what I do have now is somebody whose sofa I can crash on in West Virginia. And that was one of my missing states. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you absolutely. We've got the uh, sofa bed here in the studio. Well, now I know you, apparently you've got a complex of houses. Uh, this is something yeah. we were talking about before yeah, come we came on. the air. But you're, you're, you're a real estate magnate, apparently. Yeah, we're the... Uh, uh, the slumlords of uh, St. Albans, I, I, West Virginia. Yeah, that's, that's fine. I don't. It doesn't have to be, you know, anything. Like no, 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 no. They're very nice. They're very nice. I, I'm yeah. underselling it. You, I'm sure they you are. You always and have a place. Thank you. I mean, this is my secret goal is to always have like, you know, to be able to like, if I ever get to the point where I just want to travel the world, I always want to be able to kind of go and I got a place there and I got a place there and I got a place there. And West Virginia, I was just going to have to drive right across because I didn't, where was I going to stay? Have you? What I know, I know you were born in uh, in Pennsylvania. Have you been through West Virginia before? Uh, you know, I have it. It's one of the few states, and I've, I've traveled quite a bit, but I've never been to West Virginia. And I wasn't in Pennsylvania for long. I was born in Media, which is a yeah. suburb of uh, Philadelphia, essentially. And we were gone before I was six months old. Yeah. So there's no statue of me on the town square. You'll be shocked to hear. <laughs> which is, you know. Well, now you have to come to West Virginia. It's very. Uh... It's very beautiful in the fall. I I would love to. I mean, I you know uh, there's and, and actually my people, <laughs> my people <laughs> are kind of from that neck of the woods. Generally, they're they're from oh. Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, Alabama, West Virginia, you know, Kentucky. Oh, they're very all, nice. Yeah, Scott Scotch Irish clan that you know apparently they fucked like bunnies because there are a lot of them. <laughs> um, my grandfather was one of ten, I think. Oh, um, yeah. Half of whom were alcoholics. Maybe they were farmers. Uh, my fa my grandfather was the uh, uh, one of the fire chiefs of Oklahoma City. I think he was primarily in charge of the administration of the fire department. So no statue of him either. In fact, I don't think there's a statue of a Billingsley to be found in the world. Not one Billingsley has achieved enough demerit putting a statue or possibly even a plaque up. We are a, a, a family of wastrels and, and losers. Terrible. That is. That's, that makes me sad. That makes me it sad. Makes We're sad gonna, well, okay. So now we've got we got to build you a little statue outside uh, the studio it's too late, here. It's too, late. it's too late for me. It's, my ship has sailed. And All now right. I, it's, it's a, you know, an up-and-coming uh, Billingsley. Ho hopefully we'll achieve something. I have a, a, a relative on my mother's side. Who I'm a, I'm a wall, but but she was a starcher oh. who founded one of the counties here in West Virginia. So he has a statue. Oh, okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah my, so that's my, as close my, as I can come. I don't think my mother my mother's was a side. She was with the good bars. I don't think they achieved anything oh, either. So good bars. Wasn't that yeah. that was a candy bar, wasn't it? It was a candy bar, but unfortunately, it had nothing to do with them. Or I would I would really <laughs> be rolling it, and I'd be sitting on on, on Mr. Good Bar money. Uh, so. So you brought you brought up uh, your your role on Enterprise. So the, I got to ask the question because this is as a fan, this is one that we hotly debated. So I'm sure okay. you've answered it a zillion times. What what did you think of the finale of Enterprise? Oh yeah, I know that is such a hot button question. I mean, I thought it was a shame that because they they knew that the show was going off the air that they, they hadn't maybe put a little more thought into how they wanted to wrap the series up. I mean, I don't think right. it came as a surprise to anybody when we got canceled. I guess the thing is, if you're if you're a producer on a show, if you're a writer on a show, this is a semi-serious answer. Um, you're so busy trying to just make sure that the, you know, the work of the day gets done, yeah. that it sometimes gets a little hard to think ahead. So I, I think on a certain level, they just, they just did not get to, how are we gonna end this puppy? And then they got the cancellation notice, and I, I think they kind of, you know, were a little writer's blocked. Right. If, if in retrospect, they could have maybe trusted Manny Cotto, who had really kind of taken over, I think, a lot of the responsibilities. Yeah. The seasons. If they trusted him maybe to write a two-part conclusion, I think we'd have been better off. I always say, Con Connor, I mean, I was happy to see Connor die. Don't get me wrong. I mean, <laughs> I know. Uh, but I, I thought, you know, couldn't Trip die in the service of something a little more grandiose than foiling a cheap two-bit jewel robbery? That seemed kind of like, you know, low stakes for a conclusion. Agreed. And the Agreed. framing device generally, I thought, one, it's like, well, but they're 
considerably older than they were <laughs> in the next generation. It's like, hmm. And two, yeah, it's like, we're now the story inside somebody else's story. And that's our, that's our finale. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I would probably add to the general raspberry being given to that episode. However, I have to say, you know, I, 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 I Rick and Brandon, I mean, those guys, years and years and years and years and years and years and years of Star Trek. And I sometimes think, you know, that, that forest trees, it's like, Many, 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 many hours of, of television that people clearly enjoyed and have spent a lot of time. That's right. Uh, you know, devoting their lives to should not be lost in the in the in the focus on one eh, episode. Um, yeah. Well, and I've read that that they kind of agree. That, I yeah. I mean, I, I really felt badly for them as I've gotten. I never got to know Rick terribly well. I've gotten to know Brandon a bit. Um, yeah. And I and I, I like him a lot. And I think he's a swell guy. I, I think what happened, and I think he would say this, is that when next uh, uh not next generation when the uh, uh, voyager was going yeah. off the air they asked to have some time you know a season can we take a season off to develop a more comprehensive bible and to, and to think about you know how the show could go and the network said no they also said could the first season just take place on earth and could it be a little bit about how this this you know all happens could we kind of take a yeah you know, that would have been great and they said no I don't know whether they were, I don't know, network right, wrong. I don't know. But I, I do think, you know, one, they were kind of balked in their intentions. And two, they were kind of like told to step on the accelerator. And I think in the end, that kind of left them, you know, feeling a little aggrieved about the support they were getting. And I wouldn't be surprised if on one level, they, they kind of had a, you know, a little bit of a, of a, of a fuck you attitude going on towards yeah. you know, RTD at that point. I wouldn't blame them. Understandably, I think. I knew we were in trouble early on because there was a, you know, the craft service table where all the snacks are laid out. It was like the first couple of episodes. It was like, ooh, petty for <laughs> and, and all that shit went away. It was like, oh, uh-oh. Now it's packets of gummy bears and stale bagels. Uh-oh. We're in trouble. <laughs> it was such an underrated show, though. It wasn't, it wasn't. I mean, I, 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 I I'm, you know. I'm pretty frank since you asked for me to be opinionated. Yeah. Um, right. I, I, th I thought I think there are aspects of it that, that, that were, were good and other aspects that weren't so great. Um, in, in my opinion, and it might not have worked with the fans, I thought there was something about the darkness, uh, of the potential darkness or the potential scariness of being the first ship in space. The right, you, know, you don't trust the transporters and the weapons malfunction, and we're arguing, <laughs> we're not getting along, and they kind of tiptoed up to that. But I think in part, perhaps because of the network and in part, perhaps of, of just all the years of Star Trek and what they thought the fans wanted, I felt like they backed away from really right. going where they could go. Like there was an episode early on. I tell the story all the time because I think to me it sort of, you know, says something. I, you're not supposed to, as the actor, see the scripts in development. You, you right. Because they don't want the actors going like, I'm not hardly in this episode at all. <laughs> just hold off. But I had a little back channel in the hair trailer. So the hair guy kind of slipped me the first drafts. And I mostly wanted to read them because in those episodes I wasn't in, I could kind of go out and look for other work elsewhere. Right. I could, still, I could double dip. I could still get paid and I could go get another job too. I was so much more ambitious when I was younger. And there was one episode early on and there was a malfunction with the transporter. Right. And somebody comes back from the planet and, you know, the first draft is like, oh, my God, their head is where their ass should be. Ah! <laughs> great. I love it. By the time it gets to the, you know, the final draft after everybody's gotten there, it's like the guy comes back. He's transported back up to the ship. It's like, oh, he's got a twig sticking out of his ear. Oh, dear. Uh, the doctor will just lop that off. We should be careful about this transporter, though. It was like, <laughs> yeah, they dumbed it down. Yeah, they, they we need it down. They we need it down. And I and I, I kind of felt like, you know, to a certain extent, what could have been like not your daddy Star Trek quickly became your daddy Star Trek. Instead of using leeches, I used the hypo spray, you know, it's like right. So that part of me felt like they had a lot more potential than was realized. I'm I'm glad you said that because you know, especially with that show, because it was supposed to be kind of the you know, the the one that starts it. Yeah, yeah, we're the we're the pioneers. I mean, that's yeah, it should have been rougher, and it, and it started that way. I mean, there was a like the second episode, I think, after the pilot, 
was about you know gee we we're stopping and there's this derelict craft and we go on board and, uh, and all these entities had been drained of their lifeblood yeah the ceiling i thought i like that <laughs> and it kind of did a little bit of a cop-out ending and kind of you know turned us a little bit into 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 heroes after all yeah and in a way i thought from then on in each successive episode got less and less risky you know yeah. and it's hard i mean it's an it's it's still a network show it's not a cable show the thing about cable and short form television you know it's six episodes is it 13 episodes how many right. gonna go you don't know is you never know whether they're gonna fucking kill somebody off yeah that's true uh, so every episode is like you really are kind of like biting your teeth you know by and large you you, you know when you know everybody's going to survive and pretty much with star trek you know everything is going to kind of end reasonably well and you know it'll probably be kind of like you know a little homiletic in the end and a little pithy and a little kind of like poignant <laughs> it just becomes sort of formulaic and and you know where we are in, in our evolution as as consumers of media right I think, and i think this is you know true for when that show aired we were passing away from a kind of television that was predictable into a kind of television that was supposed to be, if not always edgy, at least unpredictable. That's right. That's and right. And I thought Enterprise was pretty predictable. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. I think that's fair. That's fair. I always thought that that last episode would have been fine earlier in the season if they just wanted to do kind of a, a fun episode, I guess, but I, I didn't like it. Yeah. As yeah. And I didn't, I didn't, you know, I mean, it's funny because Connor will say he was happy to be killed off because it kind of gave his character an arc. He had a beginning, a middle and an end. I, I, you know, personally, I thought, well, he was, he was a fan favorite, maybe the fan favorite. And I think people had a lot emotionally invested in him. And I thought, yeah. it was, uh, I thought it was kind of thoughtless to take one of your, your primary characters, maybe your primary character and not give him an end that that you know um was as 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 important as his his yeah. role was agreed i agree with that what do you think of the uh, the new series that are out i don't watch a ton of television i yeah. read a lot um i watch some i watched uh, the first five or so episodes of season one of discovery yeah and, and thought like a lot of star trek that it had some good elements yeah. And some less good elements. Um, I thought the I, the guy who played the captain, uh, um, I can't remember his name, the British actor. Oh, uh, Isaacs. Yeah, I thought he was terrific. Yeah, yeah, I liked um, him too. I think the 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 lead up to put the um, the first officer on the ship, um, yeah, the whole pilot, the claim. I'll be here's the thing. Here, this is you know what opinions Klingons bore the fuck out of me. <laughs> They just, I can't tell one from the other. They all are, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. they talk, they, it takes forever for them to articulate anything. I just get tired of them. So, you know, it's a good uh, opinion. It's probably, no, it's, it's, you know, like, see, there's a Klingon on your, on your picture right behind you. There's a Klingon oh, off yeah. in the corner, like getting all like pissed off. We need, it. we need a, uh, uh, a flox in there yelling con. I, I, you know, I mean, to know people, it's like we're lovers, we're cool, <laughs> we're like, you know, the sensualists of Star Trek. We're smart, we read. We well, you like, had, well, you had uh, several wives on the show. I had three wives. Each of the yeah. wives had three husbands. I often say that I was the first bisexual character on Star Trek. I tried, <laughs> although the script did not spell this out, to suggest with eyebrows raised in my performance that I was sleeping with anything that moved. Um, including the husbands as well as the wives. That's, that's kind of hilarious. One of my that. favorite episodes, and, and what I did like about what they gave me to do is that I felt like, you know, and this is always true for the, you know, the alien character. He's kind of the, the character through which you kind of look at human beings with a, you know, a cocked snoot. It's like, really? I, 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 I like the fact that Dr. Flox was early on. He said, I think that couple over there are, are getting ready to mate. I wonder if they'll let me walk <laughs> And then <laughs> my wife appears on the show and she spends time hitting on trip. And I say, Oh, you should go for it. You should go for it. Um, <laughs> that, that, that uh, I, I was titillated by that. I wish I, sometimes I think they weren't always true to their own uh, co concept of the character. Yeah. There were, there were times when I felt they'd kind of like upend me by having me behave in a way that was not really in, in my opinion, 
um, quite true to what I thought was his, you know, the li life is a buffet kind of attitude. But, you know, what are you going to do? Not always, sometimes. Yeah. I think I would have liked that version. Life is a buffet. Yeah. That was, that was, that was the version more often than not. But uh, when it wasn't, I always thought, that's not Fox. Yeah. There's an episode later that's like Fox wasn't, didn't want to beam down to the surface because he was kind of scared about how he would be treated. It was like, that's not Fox. Uh, when yeah, I found out Fox was it. Denobial and infantry, it's like, I don't think so. But that's right. Yeah, that's all right. So, so I shouldn't hold my breath that you're going to show up on Picard. Uh, I, at, at a convention a couple of years ago, I crashed the stage when uh, Jonathan Frakes was moderating. <laughs> I said, "Where the fuck are the Denobulans? Come on, guys, get with it! My species lives to be God knows how long. You could easily have me on the show." Absolutely. Uh, and yet, and yet, in spite of some fans' attempts to stir the pot. I guess some fans actually are stirring the pot to such an extent that there are people who are like, shut up. Who are you? I, and I don't know who John Billingsley is. And no, we don't want him back. So I, I, they may have, some of my fans may have screwed me out of. That's right. On the other hand, I don't know that I want to go through the makeup again. So it's not as if I'm really. How long me. did it take you to put that on each time? Uh, well, I just had to sit in the chair. It took the guy who put it on about uh, two and a half hours. Yeah. Um, two hours and well, 45. Yeah, I guess I should have said, how long did it take to put that on you? Yes, yes. How, how long did I have to sit in the chair? Uh, I had I was I had to be there about three hours before the other actors. Basically, that's a commitment. But I was number seven on the call sheet, so it wasn't as if I was there all the time. So I I, I believe me, I was I had a, I had a cushy gig. I had a little song I sang. I, I used to sing it to piss Dominic off as I was leaving. People who <laughs> heard me interviewed are saying, I've heard these same stories before. Can't you ever say anything new? <laughs> but for what a good worth, story's a good story. You haven't heard it. Yes. As I was leaving, you know, my my one day of work in that episode, I would I would usually kind of try and find Dominic, particularly if he was in the spacesuit. And I would sing, Day off, day off. Six days off and the checks still come. Character actor in the sun. Six days off and the checks still come. I had more verses, but Dominic would usually yell at me at, at that point, and I would have to stop. That is one thing about the show. It was pretty well casted. Yeah, I think I think so too. I mean, I think I I suspect that probably. Um, if Dominic and I may have thought this. I, I, maybe this was true for for uh, Linda and Anthony too. I don't know that we were aware when the show started that it was going to very quickly turn into primarily the triangular relationship between Trip, the captain, and to Paul that they would try and and mirror in essence the McCoy, Spock, Kirk relationship. Right. Um, how conscious a decision that was right out of the gate, how quickly they just leaned into that because they felt like people really liked Trip, especially. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I didn't, I still had some fun stuff to do, but it wasn't as much. And I don't know how, right. how much you ever really can quite involve the doctor. It wasn't as much, I think, as, as um, he, my nemesis Bob Cardo got to do. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not being entirely facetious when I say in the first couple of years, I, I just actively searched for other work and they were generous enough to let me double dip <laughs> so I did other things while I was still on Enterprise. The third season, they were using me a little bit more. And I think the nature of, of some of the, the Zindi arc kind of called for the crew to interact a little bit more. So they were, it was a little busier. I found yeah. I got busier in years three and four. Well, that's good. That's good. I was I was actually very dis at the time very disappointed that we didn't get further seasons. Yeah, I was expecting I, seven. You kind of assume it's going to be seven. I, yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and certainly. Well, we all assumed when we we were cast, you know, based on the history. Yeah. That, yeah seven years. Hoo, hoo, ha. But I think when you look at the ratings and when you consider that UPN itself was a dying network yeah. and did not have the support of CBS, we began uh, fairly early on, or at least I think, you know, some of us did, uh, to think we're lucky as hell to have gotten a season two. Oh, my God, a season three. A miracle. We got a fourth season? I mean, UPN had nothing. They had wrestling. Yeah. They had. They did not have much. And we were also 
uh, preempted uh, in, in many networks across the country. I mean, you know, as opposed to say CBS, NBC, et cetera, they're, when they talk to their affiliate stations, it's like, you're going to air our shows. And there's no argument about it. UPN did not have the power to tell, you know, Fort Worth to air the show on Friday night. If Fort Worth wanted to cancel it for high school football or move it around on the schedule, they would. I watched a lot of episodes or recorded a lot of episodes at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, some of it, some of the ratings, I think, had to do with the fact that, you know, it was a little Star Trek fatigue. Some of it, I think, had to do with fans who didn't necessarily cotton to what they were trying to do with uh, the captain figure, you know, what they were trying to make of Scott. Some right. of it, I think, had to do with people who wanted it to be darker. Some of it, I think, had to do with people who wanted it not to be as dark. Somehow we kind of missed every boat insofar as the large fan base went. And we very quickly went from like, you know, 10 million people to 1 million people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was a fast decline. So I, I was always kind of like stunned we made it to four years. Yeah. Well, I re if I remember right, after season two, it, there was some doubt if it was going to make it back for season three. And then definitely after season three, there was doubt. Big, there was doubt at, at every off season. There's big doubt. Yeah. I, mean, you know, um, I, I think probably we felt we were safe for season two because at that time it was like, well, UPN got none of them. And then season three, it was like, oh, no. <laughs> uh, season four, you know, Scott Bakula himself really kind of went to bat for it with Kerry McCluggage of. Uh, yeah. And I mean, there, you know, there was some some big water lifting done by some folks behind the scenes that got us that fourth season. Um, well, so I'm assuming you haven't got to do a, a convention in about a year and a half. I just did. A, I just did one in Vegas. Oh, actually. you did. How was yeah. it? Uh, it was fun. I mean, I love doing the conventions. I always I, I really miss them. I love uh, interacting with the fans. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's always been a great I mean, one of the great Bennies of Star Trek, even for, as I like to call our show, the show that killed the franchise, uh, is that is that you get to you know travel the world essentially on the company dime. Yeah. So Bonnie and I, for years, have gone to conventions. We do kind of a low vaudeville act. Uh, you know, we bring out cream pies and seltzer bottles. We run around. We, you know, we, we are a, a sophomoric to the extreme and have great fun. Um, so I've really missed the conventions. Yeah. They had one in Vegas, the annual Creation Vegas event. Um, yeah. Great. To, I went, even though I, I didn't really have much to do. I was just, you know, in one panel and did a little bit of signing. But it's great to be around, the, you know, around everybody in the universe, especially yeah. all my pals who were on the various shows. I mean, you, you, the nice thing about those conventions down the years is that even the show that you weren't on or the shows you weren't on, you get to know those folks. And it that's is, right. It's a familial, you know, it's a very familial environment. Yeah, uh, that's. I, I think that's the best part about uh, Star Trek. I've always said that. I'm. I, I could never be an actor, but if I was. If oh, come I had that, on, you were mate number two. I've heard I was mate heart. number two. I have to yeah. admit, there's been there's been some rumblings that you missed your calling, man. I don't know. I mean, the road not taken. Holy shit. I'd be interviewing if, you. If only. But if I had that one role on whatever science fiction fantasy show it was, I would just be showing up at conventions in costume. They wouldn't even have to invite me. I'd just be wow. there. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I, I I'd make a whole career down, You'd be walking down the street in costume. You'd be going to restaurants in costume. Oh yeah, I'd be at the grocery no, store. You would not. You would not be having any sex at all, though. You would be totally. <laughs> you'd be like, uh, uh, it's probably for the best. It probably is. It probably yeah. is. Somebody was looking out for me for sure. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Absolutely for sure. Me, I mean, I hate to get dressed up. I, it's the thing I hate the most. I, I'm not even wearing pants right now. I just hate. Well, why would you? Well, but here you are in this business in which you're, you know, you got to wear these elaborate costumes and hours and makeup. I mean, it's the irony is, is that the, the thing I hate most in the world is having to get all cleaned up and spruced up. And, and yet it's what my business requires. That's what it requires. <laughs> did you did you have a favorite episode from the show? Um, probably not one that other people liked, but uh, my favorite episode for me one, because I got to spend a fair amount of time with Scott Bakula, who I just love. He's such a sweet, funny, wonderful yeah. man. Was a night in sick bay. Um, kind of a hated, love it or hated episode. The people who who appreciated it's whimsy, 
I think dug it. It's the captain's dog is sick and he doesn't want to yeah. leave the dog unattended. So he basically crashes with me in sick bay and it's kind of an Oscar and Felix. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I think there are people who felt that it kind of um, made the captain seem either kind of silly or ineffectual or stupid. Uh, right, it, right. From my point of view, it was a great opportunity, one, to get to know more about the doctor, because you probably learned more about him in that That's episode right. than you did in any other episode. And two, it was a great opportunity to kind of, you know, actually have an extended series of scenes with Scott, which I rarely had. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, the scenes I generally had with Scott, where Scott would come in and he'd be, you know, like wanting information about some medical crisis and I'd go blah, 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 the endocrine system. <laughs> be some kind of moral crisis and Scott would come in and he'd be kind of like, this is what we should do. And I'd say, oh no, this is what we should do. And he'd go, no. And I'd say, yes. And he'd say, no. And I'd say, yes. And then he'd walk away. I'd do what the fuck I wanted anyway. <laughs> nobody was going to tell Dr. Flox. Nobody's going to put Flox in. Right. Yeah, he was, you were probably going to pull out some type of alien animal. No, I was always like, like shaking my head. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I was doing whatever the fuck I wanted. I, I, I like, I'm surprised they didn't have like a brick that I was just locked in permanently for disobeying orders. It's like, that's what I've got. I liked about the Denobians. Apparently it was like, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Very good. Very good. You can do what I want. <laughs> Gently contentious species in, uh, in outer space. Did did you do theater growing up in school? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I didn't, I didn't go to. There are high schools in America that you know, performing arts high schools, obviously, but also high schools from from certain parts of the world where where there are very elaborate shows and big drama departments. I went to an eight hundred person high school in suburban Connecticut. Oh yeah, for shows, most of them tended to be musicals, and I'm not a singer or a dancer, so I. It wasn't as if I was like a, you know, a theater rat in high school. I, I always liked to act. I took, uh, I took uh, acting classes with some New York based professional actors on and off for years, but I, I don't think my parents thought I was going to pursue an acting career. I think if they had actually thought that they probably would have put me in a re-education camp. Um, <laughs> I, I, I probably thought I was going to be a novelist if I thought at all about my there future. You go. I really only thought about when am I going to get laid? What is it going to be <laughs> for me to have sex and how will it happen and where will it happen and when will it, it's all I cared about. And my only deal with my parents was they insisted I go to college. It was like, there was going to be no, I wanted to go. It's just good school. parenting. They were like, nope, you're going to college. It was like, all right, then I'm going to a girl's school. So I only applied to like Vassar, Bennington. It's like, I'm going to college so I can get laid and I need all the help <laughs> I can get. So it's all about the ratio. I want to go to a school that's at least 65% female. Although I had not factored lesbianism in. So it was like, I did go to a school that was 65% female, but when you factor in lesbianism, it's like, oh, the ratio isn't so great. Well, fact, turned, you can't so. plan for everything. You did you the best you could with the knowledge I you had. I turned several girls into lesbians. <laughs> I Bobby Gustafson. You didn't the help problem, the ratio. No, she slept with me on Friday night and she was a lesbian by Monday morning. It's like, what the fuck? Talk about humbling. So. Oh, no sports? Uh, yeah, tennis. Um, oh, okay. I, like tennis. I was a good tennis player, but not no teams. I did not, I had no interest in playing on a team. I had no interest. I mean, I, I didn't belong to any after school clubs. Yeah. Um, I'm not. Uh, I mean, it's funny because, you know, when, when you are in the theater, when you're in the world of the theater, you know, you, you actually you spend your entire life forming these incredibly tight, close knit associations with a group of people for three or four months. And then you do it again and you do it again and you do it again and you do it again. So you have to be intensely social. But when yeah. I was in high school growing up, although I had a lot of friends and I loved my friends and we hung out, I did not want to be part of any formal anything. It was like school was bad enough. I, I was a big reader and a shitty student. I, I don't know why. I've always had this sort of like rebellious streak or something. As soon as somebody assigned a book, it was like, that's the last book I will ever <laughs> read in my life. Now, now I've gone back and I've read all those books. It's like, oh, I, I was good. I was good. That's pretty good. But, yeah. But I, I prided myself on like, I'll read the first page and the last page and I'll fake my way through. You're a rebel. I don't know what I was. I don't. I was lazy. I don't know what the fuck I was, but I just could not. Well, I, that's I, usually what it is. Usually, you'll say, "I'm a rebel," 
But what you are is lazy. That's yeah. Usually. Yeah, exactly. And, and I and I was too lazy to say I was a rebel because that seemed to come with a lot of demands. It was like, <laughs> a rebel. well, there's some standards to, you got to stand up. Yeah, to. Exactly. Rebels. It's like, you know, I'm going to have to do some rebellious shit. And I was like, I'm too lazy. So, but I didn't want to say I was lazy because then people would come down on me. Well, no, and that's I gonna tried to, bad I just try to yeah. avoid the conversation entirely. It's like, you know, it's like, look over there, divert. <laughs> no. I spent some time as a hermit. I think that's, I understand. I was, I was never a hermit. I was always very social. I had a lot of pals. I, I <laughs> like I like to fuck around with my buddies. I just didn't want to do it under under anybody's rules. And I didn't want to okay. have like, you know, an agenda. It was like. <laughs> so you weren't an introvert. You were social. I was definitely not an introvert. <laughs> I just was not much for structure, you know. Yeah. Although Didn't now I, I am. Well, now you're an introvert? No, no, no. Now I'm a structuralist. I oh, help, now I you're help, I help to run a not-for-profit and, you know, so much about the work. And and candidly, I, I started a theater company. I helped to start an acting school. Really? It's really hard. It's hard to have an acting career if you're not very, very structured. Um, it's odd, but somehow for what I was as a kid to what I am now, it's like, I think the aliens must have sucked me up to space and planted a new brain and <laughs> popped me back down because I'm... Uh, I'm, so are, I'm, are you, do you teach not, at your acting school? Uh, back then, I started, a, I, I was a co-founder of an acting school called Freehold. And yes, we, I taught. I taught a lot of uh, Meisner, Sanford Meisner, who has a very oh, yeah. specific way of, uh, you know, trying to train actors rooted in yeah. the idea that you don't impose your own pre-thought through structure on a scene you have thoughts about it, but you really are available to what the other actors are giving you in the moment. It's it's designed to kind of um, help you open up your spontaneous appreciation of in the moment uh, reality. That's kind of kind of uh, some improv, I would guess. Is yeah, in, 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 there is improv. There's a lot of improv, but a lot of it is really making sure that you are. It, it, to be honest with you, as much as anything, it's just about learning how to listen. And, and even now, I'm always stunned on sets sometimes at how um, how ineffective sometimes scenes are because the actors aren't really listening to each other. You know? uh, yeah, that actually makes sense to me as a non-actor because you can tell as a fan when actors aren't as connected as they should be if they don't have the chemistry you know, in the role as they should, I think. Yeah, and a lot of things come into play. I mean, I think particularly for if you're number one on the call sheet and you've got, and it's a television series and you've got a lot of words, um, sometimes yeah. it's the sheer, the sheer um, uh, 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 arduousness of the task. Right. Putting all that language into your head. You can see sometimes actors, they'll, you can almost see them scrolling the words across their <laughs> brain because they're just trying to call up the language. But that takes you that much more out of the moment, the moment, the moment, which is right in front of you, which is based on what you're getting from your partner in all of its detail, you know, and, and all of its detail is impossible to to put on paper, but it's it's everything. It's it's in the eyes. It's in the mouth. It's in the words it's in the body. It's everything that you're picking up from your partner. If you're leaning, if you're essentially leaned in to your partner based on what you need from this act, this character, based on what you've determined the scene requires you to need. If you're right. available, it'll take you places that are unpredictable. And then you'll go for a really spontaneous, imaginative, fun ride. If you're worried about what am I saying? What am I saying? What must I feel? How do I project my feelings? And you're self-conscious, it, it's basically masturbatory. You know? Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense because you're not in the moment. Yeah. And it's hard. I mean, that's hard. You know, moment to moment acting. It. It. You know. What do you do when when you're not getting anything from the person that you're in the scene with? Uh, one of one of the things that, that Meisner said is like, there's no such thing as nothing. You're always getting something. I mean, you know, it, it, you get, there's a sentient being across from you, <laughs> and and what you are getting has meaningfulness. Just, you know, let it in. There's how no does that uh, how does that affect you in the last year or so when we're doing so many things remotely where maybe you're not acting opposite somebody? Um, well, one, I'm I'm 
kind of quasi semi demi retired i suppose for lack of a better word people make fun of me because i do still work but um, <laughs> about four and a half five years ago i've always been involved in volunteering for various um yeah not for profits that have some kind of you know social justice or social service uh um, functionality and I, I kind of flipped the script a little bit about five years ago and kind of prioritized that work and de-emphasized the acting work. Right. So, well, good for you. I, I mean, I and I may be in the process of flipping it again, or I don't know. I mean, you know, life has changed. But but I, I, I was not as aggressive about, you have to be very aggressive in, in, in film and television. If you want to work all the time, it, it's a constant knock-knock yeah on your manager's door on your agent's door is letting casting directors know you're around that you're available it's going to red carpets it's doing social media i mean it, there's so many fucking actors <laughs> yeah easy. yeah it's very easy to get lost in the shuffle and you're competing with some particularly as you get older some really good people right so if you want to work all the time it has to be your full-time job and and my wife and I didn't have kids. We saved our dough. I don't need to work again. So you know, my my honest to, to God feeling is is like I'm happy when it's there, and when it's not there, I couldn't care less. I'll do other shit. Don't you think that you should you should go out as Scrooge? You should do an adaption as Scrooge and just kind of full circle. Lazy. <laughs> No, I, I don't do stage work anymore, and it is lazy. I mean, you know, I used to be a stage actor. It's incredibly arduous. Yeah. Particularly, you know, there, there are different, you know, kinds of... It, it, lort is League of Regional Theater. So if you're going to shoot, if you're going to play something in a lort house, you're probably going to do eight shows a week, and the right. only day you off, off you have is Monday. And on the weekends, Friday, two shows on Saturday, two shows on Sunday, it, you're, you're like a limp rag on Monday morning. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't want to live that life anymore. Uh, the alternative is to do what they call 99 seat theater here, which is, you know, smaller houses where you may do, you know, three shows a week uh, to very small houses. You don't get any money and that's not a problem. But the nature of that work is such that it's usually candidly either under rehearsed or understaged or under financed. The, the right. production values aren't there. You don't know if there's going to be an audience. And, and I, I have found that to be unsatisfying for, for the opposite reason. It's like, right. and, and now when all is said and done, I'm just not that much of a theater guy anymore. I still love to go to the theater, but I just don't have no, I don't, I don't miss it. Well, what about uh, what what about voice work? I know you did some you did Doug Dodgers. Yeah, but one, I don't need the money, and that's that changes for life. <laughs> I got to say that change when you when you get to the yeah, point of I don't need the money. Uh, if I yeah. never work again, I'm going to die with more money than I ever thought I'd have in my entire life. And it's not like I'm like like you know you know, but I'm it, it's just me and the misses. We have yeah. a small house. We live somewhat frugally. We I, I just don't need to work. I think that's terrific. It, it, just, yeah, it's just change. It's strange because it just means that everything you know people ask about is like, well, how about? It's like, why would I want to do that if I don't have to? Yeah, I like to read. What I like to do is get up in the morning. I like to read the paper. I like to read a book. I'll go for a walk. You know, maybe I'll have lunch with the misses. If there's acting, great. If you know there's there's work to do with the not for profit, that's probably twenty hours a week. Yeah. Uh, I travel. I just live my life. I don't. I don't. I, I have no. That most, sounds wonderful. I, it's, I, yeah, it's great. Sign me well, up. It's like the voiceover. It's like, why do I want to play like some stupid fucking guy in a cartoon? <laughs> probably not going to see the light of day. Commercials, I have, you know, no, I don't want to do it. Yeah. Uh, film and TV acting, I still really like. And if I if I was getting more interesting parts more frequently, I might lean into the work a little bit more aggressively. I might be a little bit more like, you know, hey guys, with my agents. But at a certain age, you also have to reckon with ageism in this business. Yeah. Most of what's out there for a guy my age, my weight, my type is is not, you know, that interesting. Some of it's interesting, but a lot of it is like, meh. Yeah. So again, it's like, how much work do I want to put in to get meh parts? Have you thought about podcasting? Never. Not in well, there you, go. you know why? Because I'm too lazy. People I'm going to keep, keep a seat hard more time understanding the concept of <laughs> I find Oh, no, you... no. I, 
I'm completely type B. I totally get that. My wife is type A and wears me out. But I also, you know, she I gets. I know, but here you are. You have a podcast. I, and I, I, I'm i sure. And you're doing it out of love. It, well, yes, it is out of love. This is just, just for me. I don't love anything. Except yeah. the wives. Except the wives. But you're very opinionated. You'd fit right. And yet, you, you know, be... you really haven't touched on some of my more like, you know, I mean, God, you haven't asked me a political question yet. That's what I no. really alienate people. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. And, you know, it's a hotbed. You know, we're a uh, a red state here. In, I know you uh, are. Uh, I know you're about as red as you get. You're we used to be a blue state. state. It It's I so know. strange. And, well, you know, so our governor was elected as a Democrat. And switched to Republican I know. midterm. I know. And and you had one of the most frustrating senators, too, although I understand his point of view. It's like, you know, I mean, you want a red senator? Because he's hanging on by his He is. Out. Well, he kind of is. He's kind of a red senator disguised as a Democrat. Well, I mean, he's he's like he's like what, you know, like an old Jeffersonian Democrat. I mean, the Democratic yeah. Party has shifted and changed too. I mean, you know It's true. I don't know. It's weird. It's weird as a, you know, somebody who's always been really interested in politics. Do you have opinions on this mess in Afghanistan? Yeah, we had to get out. We had yes. to get out. I think Biden's the only one who had the guts to say, you know what, I'm going to take the shit. I'm going to take the shit. Do I, do I wish that we had been able to extricate ourselves without the, you know, classic egg on our face? Oh my God, people hanging from the airplanes, people. Yeah, yeah, sure. But is that feasible? No. These, you know, that's Monday morning quarterbacking that suggests that somehow there was a way to kind of artlessly and effortlessly pull out. It's like, find a guerrilla war in which in a long right. fucking world, the people who were there who were trying to get out were able to extricate themselves without egg on their face. I mean, possible. the mistake was made 20 years ago. Exactly. And I remember when 9-11 occurred, it was like, treat it like a crime. If we treat it like a holy war, we're going to spend years wasting yeah. blood and treasure to fight something that cannot be won. Yeah. And, I, and, you know, when you look at the long debacle that was Iraq and Afghanistan. Yes. To what fucking end? You know? None. None. I, it's I, a waste of uh, time, and, money, and, and, and lives. And, and this is what I really get opinionated on you, is that, you know, one thing you can't say is that when 9-11 occurred, it was all about those bastards. The long history of Western involvement in the Middle East, from the point of view of a Middle Easterner, everything that could happen to us was deserved. We treated those lands and the people who lived there That's as right. if they were vassal states and we could do whatever the fuck we wanted to get their commodities. After the end yeah. of the First World War, we created a modern Middle East to serve our needs. You know, Iraq shouldn't have even been a state. We pushed a bunch of tribes together and we yeah. said, let's call you a state because it'll be easier to get your oil that way. We created the conditions under which constant civil war took place. And surprise, surprise, in the Middle East, people hated our fucking guts. Yeah. And they shot at us when they had a whack. And for us, it's like, how dare you? <laughs> no, but that you're exactly right. You're exactly right. Most of our problems we have helped create. Yeah. And, and, you know, and so I, 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 Biden, I mean, I'll be honest with you. It was like, I, I it was the last guy I wanted, but I think he was the only guy that could have won. Yeah. And I agree. Think, you know, it's a great historical irony. And I, and I actually have been very happy with the way he has fought for what, what potentially could be um, a true game changing changes in the nature of how the government provides services to people in need yeah. um, and we've needed it. It's, it's a generate. I mean, we've been, we've been starving for that kind of uh, governmental support for a, a long, long time. We have, that's so absolutely the SNAP true. Program and on and on and on and on and on. Do you think that we will learn anything no. from this mess? Yeah, I agree. Agree. No, I, no, I have a feeling it won't be long. We'll be in some other mess. Hegel, Hegel said, actually, I just had that book. Where was it? I love this quote. Uh, this is a great book, uh, The Retreat of Western Liberalism by Edward Luce. Uh, it, his uh, opening, Hegel, we learn from history that we do not learn from history. Oh, I love it. Yeah, that's a great quote. Yeah. 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 No, no, it's, it's, uh, man. It's sad, and 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 to and to be honest with you, when you can when you think about what what was the true crisis, 
you know, 20th century, uh, 21st century crisis? Was it terrorism or was it climate change? I mean, if you look at what's happening in the world right now and you look at what we're up against yeah. and you look at what it's going to do to climate refugeeism, which is going to drive more fascism, you know, as more and more millions of people start, start flooding across borders because they have yeah. to get out of states and countries that are drowned, unlivable. Right. That's going to bring more horror and atrocity and terrorism to this world than anything else. Did we did we do one goddamn thing to address the issues of climate change? We did no. not. No, I actually, that, I actually really agree with you. We have really messed things up. Oh, for, and I worry about that. You know, I'm a, I'm a granddad now, so I, I'm really worried about that for uh, for the young kids. Yeah, no, yeah, I know. It's, 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 you know, I mean, I remember I just was crying for days and days after 9-11. And obviously, you know, it's not to say that the, the loss of life itself and the atrocity and, you know, that was so d damaging and painful. But I was crying for days and days thinking, like, what is this going to mean for our world over the course of the next 25 years yeah. or longer? We have this. This is going to be a generational blot because we're going to fuck yeah. it up. And we, we did. We're going to do exactly what we did. Yeah, you know, we did. Congressman Barbara Lee from uh, Oakland, the only woman, the only woman in the House who said. No, yeah. Yeah. Nothing. She was the only one. One. Yeah. One. And she if you was, remember, uh, you remember Wayne Morse? He was pretty much the only one who said something similar when it came to Vietnam, when Tonkin Gulf happened. He was one of the few who said, I, no, <laughs> no, I'm not going to give a blank check to escalate the Vietnam War. Yeah. And he yeah. was as a pariah in his day as well. Yeah, they were proven correct. Do, do you have an opinion on the, the Capitol riot? Yes, I think the sentences should be considerably more severe than they are so far. I think people are getting off of the blank check. I think it's, I yeah. think it's ridiculous. I agree. Five months. It was, yeah. uh, that was one of the most upsetting things that I've seen. Yeah, it's, I'm sorry. And, and, you know, I mean, I, I, Trump should be in jail. I'm sorry, but he, he, he is a traitor to his country. I mean, and, and was from the jump, whether or not he actively colluded with Putin and there was, you know, right. uh, he accepted <laughs> the interference of a foreign state and he knew it was happening. He knew that Russia had, had was behind the WikiLeaks. He knew that Russia was behind all the false bullshit on social media. He took their support to win an election. That in and of itself is a traitorous act. And I think we yeah. miss the forest for the trees when we look at the Mueller report and say, oh, well, there's no smoking gun that says they had a meeting behind, behind you know, closed doors. There was a cover up that was demonstrably yeah. proven. And he absolutely accepted. It wasn't even that good of a cover up. No, it was a horrible cover up. And I, I don't know if anybody, I mean, you know, if you read, did you read the Mueller report by any chance? I, I did. I did. Well, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. I mean, what, I mean, at the end of the day, he says, you know, and uh, in every instance, yes, yes, it was a cover up. Yes. From the firing of, 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 uh, um, 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 Comey on yes. through every step of the way, it was an attempt to cover up a series of crimes, or at least a series of, of, of perceived crimes. And the only reason that that Mueller said, you know, what are you going to do is because you can't, in, in his opinion, you can't indict a sitting president because they wouldn't be able to, you know, they wouldn't go to court, so he wouldn't be able to respond to the charges. It was like, <laughs> for the fucking trees. It was like, I uh, no disrespect to Mueller's investigatorial skills, but it's like he is like you needed somebody else to yeah. fucking you know, put that over the top who could see something beyond, you know, he's like you're an accountant. It's not a ledger. It's a it's a save our nation situation, pal. I it's wish it was just as simple it, if it was just so simple that, you know, whatever the choice you do the one that is right, but it's never that simple, you know, and, and it's on both sides. Well, he, he, he needed, I think, in his role to appreciate that what we were asking for as a country, what we needed as a yeah. nation was a true accounting of what the of 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 what was at issue and to yeah. narrow it down to I, I have to simply back away from making any determination here of illegality because the law stipulates this narrowly. It's like. There's so much more at stake. We are. Well, he copped out on it. He copped he out. Did. Yeah, and it it dragged on for months, and then we got nothing out of it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it was the first of of many heartbreaks.
Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's been a, but you know, this has been going back. I mean, you know, going back and for years and years and years and years and years and years and years. I mean, I, I, a guy named Rick Perlstein wrote a series of books going back to the uh, Goldwater election in which he basically yeah. traces the rise of the conservative party and the very conscious efforts being made to essentially subvert democracy in the name of authoritarianism. This yeah. has been the Republican project going back for ages, that and an embrace of, of the, the far racist right after the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Yeah. Nixon, yeah. I mean, Nixon stole Wallace's Southern strategy and made it his own. Well, now they're, we're kind of reaping what they have sown over the decades. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Trump is in that sense was not, you know, I mean, he was more of what what history threw up than he was an historical actor in his own right. It's like he just was yeah. was shark like enough to say, oh, well, you know, this is what you've created. You just haven't claimed it fully yet. I'll claim it fully. Yeah. Part yeah. Authoritarian, authoritarianism and racism. He saw the opportunity and he definitely took advantage of it. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. And he I'm gave him that. Yeah, and he was not wrong about you know all the all the little you know gutless, craven, sycophantic cowards in the Republican Party would fall in line, and they did. Yeah. It's a, so you, so I'm pretty opinionated. Yeah, see that's see there you go, there you go. There's the the sidekick podcaster I need. And there and there you go. And I got and I you know people who are listening past the seven minute mark was like, oh he's so oh this is like oh they're talking about enterprise, and then all of a sudden it's like what 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 what. Hey, I know you're going to be very popular in West Virginia. Oh, I was going to say, I know. Now I'm probably not going to have. To, I'm not going to be able to do you now. Sorry. You know, got, well, you got, can stay here. I just I won't be able to tell anybody. No, no, no. And I will probably have to wear some kind of a disguise. And uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I know. No, I'm, not, I'm, I'm only welcome now in seven states. Actually, it's, it's <laughs> it might be six now. Might be six. No, I wasn't counting on West Virginia. Oh, you were counting. Like, okay, okay. Oh, they're gonna love me in West Virginia with my Planned Parenthood T-shirt, <laughs> which I should have worn for this interview. Oh yeah, you totally should have. My ACLU no. hat. We we they Fascist. actually they they actually finally started a uh, a decent uh, convention circuit here in West Virginia. So you never oh, yeah. know. We might, oh, you I've, might show. I've, you know, I, I've, you know, I lived in Alabama. I lived in Louisiana. I've shot all over the South. I mean, you know, my yeah. feeling is like, look, I will, I will sit at a bar. I will have a drink. As long as we don't know, like start, start calling each other names, we can say whatever the fuck we want. That's right. And, and you know, I, I, if you don't want to drink with me, that's fine. What happened to those days? That's the way it used to be. When I grew up, we would sit around the table as a family. Nobody agreed. But when you got up, nobody was mad. Everybody argues. Yeah, I, I don't nice. know. I think it's social media. You know, a lot of it is, is you know, I mean, the whole point of a dialogue is that you interrupt each other and you argue and you talk yeah. over each other. But when you're on social media, it's like, you know, you have an uninterrupted period in which you just go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're shielded to some Wait, 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 you know. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You can, there's a lot and of. Uh, you're not in the bar because you're at your fucking computer. Yeah. There's another great book called Bowling Alone. I can't remember the name of the guy who wrote it, but this guy's argument, uh, Robert Putnam, he started writing back in the 70s. And his argument was, you know, back in the day, we grew up in a network of a uh, nexus of, of relationships where like you're on the Little League team and you go to church and you're in a bowling league and you play bridge and yada, 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 blah, 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 blah. And, and as, as we've gotten further away from that world and now we're kind of at our computers all day, we simply have lost that skill. That skill yeah. of shooting the shit with each yeah. other in a non-confrontational way. Yeah, not getting, you know, all riled up. Now I get riled up, but I figure like you can, you know, it's like I mean But it doesn't that, last. The, you no, don't and, and, and that's part upset. of the fun of being at a bar with a bunch of people is like, you know, oh wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. I mean, but it's it's fun. That's right. I, I yeah, where did that go? Now you can't do it because somebody's going to take it too far. I mean, I still think you can do it, and I still think it is getting done. I, I just, I, I unfortunately, <laughs> you know, kind of feel like it's, it's maybe it's a vanishing art. I don't know. I like to think there's still people who go into so bars. If I'm hearing you right, if if I did a podcast at a bar where you could just sit and and be opinionated, then I could get you on there. I'm on a podcast now. We mean like you're acting. Well, I'm like talking a, about as a regular. 
Oh, regular, <laughs> regular, regular. Where's this bar located? I'm not going to relocate. Uh, to West I'm going to have to locate it somewhere close to you, I guess. You would have to, yeah. But of course, you wouldn't have the same the same level of disagreement in Los Angeles if people would be going, oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, we're our fascist country. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I would need to be in West Virginia. Yeah, you'd have, have to come here. You'd have to come yeah. here. And and you know better than I whether I'm I'm risking uh, life and limb. I, I mean, I'm generally speaking, I've gotten out alive so far, so far, uh, so far. But there have been times when it's like you, you're going to pick up the phone one day, and, and it's, it's going to be there's that podcasting guy. He's down the street at some bar wanting me to come down to. <laughs> well, I, I rarely say no to somebody calling. He's wanting my opinion. Like, and or, you, I'll and be down there and be like, we're putting on Scrooge. Or Christmas yeah, you're not Carol. Gonna me, you're not going to get me for that. That's work. What, no, what about oh, Babes in Toyland? Not going to do that either. Holding I'll let forth, you be the second mate. Don't want to be the second mate. Holding forth at a bar is not work. That's fun. That's, why that I like fun. That's just I, gabble. I I would say that uh, podcasting is fun for me. That's why I do it. I understand. I, I know. I get it. I get the appeal of podcasting. It's just that, you know, what I, what I, if it was as easy as this, but see, now you got to post it. And yeah, you yeah, yeah. Promote it. And you got to do all that other stuff. Yeah, it's that's that's, that's the hard part. Just the talking part's the best. The talking part's fine. I know. And and people have asked me if I would do one. It's like you know, and it's like if I could just talk, maybe. Yeah. But I don't want to do any other stuff. Well, you have to have a team because I'm lazy. Yeah. I don't, well, I, can, I I was gonna say I don't have a team, but I do. My son does all of the stuff behind the scenes. He edits. He does all the the posting, all that stuff. I've got yeah. the easy job. Yeah, and I, but I, you know, but I always say yes to podcasts. I figure like it's like having a podcast of my own because I always say yes to podcasts, and, I, and then I get don't know what I'm getting into, and it's just you know it's always entertaining, and I get to meet somebody I've never seen before in my life. I know, I know. If we were called not opinionated, you probably wouldn't come on. Well, I know. For, refresh my memory because you know, I get, I get, you know, I do, I do do a lot of these, and and there's one gentleman who got back to me, and I don't think that was you who said we talked a long time ago, and and you said that you know you you were pretty unfiltered, and we we were a little concerned about that. They got back to me recently and said we've decided that that we like unfiltered. It was like no, oh, okay. that was not that me. Was, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was somebody. <laughs> so I I did drop my note. I said, "Are you sure? Are you sure uh, that you I like unfiltered? Pretty unfiltered. I'm filtered about like certain things. Like I I never diss. I I don't like dissing people I've worked with or people. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah, no but Bernie I'm, Bridges. Yeah, exactly. And and you know, I mean, in this everybody everybody in the professional world is doing the best they can do. You know. Yeah. Some yeah. people are good. Some people aren't as good. Some people irritate you. Some people, you know, generally speaking, I don't like to ever diss on anybody I've ever worked with. But in the world of politics and governance and all that fucking shit, it's like, oh, I have at it. I'm opinionated. Yeah, that's pretty good. I am kind of insulted that you're doing this just with anybody. Come I'm on. sorry. Yeah, I, I told you I was a slut, uh, uh, you know, which I know is not, you know, a politically correct word to use anymore. It's, I don't uh, know pejoratively. I, I, I think it's such a great word, and I'm afraid it's no longer one you can kind of drop <laughs> in a casual conversation. But You've uh, lost the use of that word now. I know. I've lost the use of so many words. I'm 61, and, you know, and I I, 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 I don't... I don't like the phrase politically correct because I think when people say, oh, he's so politically correct, it's basically a way of their saying, I really want to be able to say shitty things. And I don't want to say shitty things, but I do think there are certain words that had uh, that that had a certain kind of um, uh, 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 um, grandeur that yeah. are uh, denied to me. Uh, yeah. I, for instance, my father was gay. He was a gay sailor, and yeah. growing up, um, although I didn't know he was gay until much later, his favorite word was cocksucker. <laughs> so I, I grew up. Well, it used to be used a lot more than now. You can't really yeah. do that. But now, you know, friends of mine and I, you know, I grew up in the theater. I've, I have a ton of very dear friends who are gay. And, and a gentleman I worked with said, you know, that's a really don't use that word because it, it is pejorative. It basically yeah. says it is a disgusting thing to do something that personally I really love. And I'm <laughs> going from. And I thought, oh. Yeah, you're right. I never thought of it that way. Well, yeah, when you say it that way, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, when you when you say it that way, and, and that's the thing. I mean, words like, you know, to gyp somebody, you know, what does that say about what you think about gypsies? Jew it down. All these things that, you know, no, yeah. no, 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 no. no. If, if you're of an age, you had to, as you were growing up, 
address each of those things and go, oh, 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 oh. Yeah, oh, you're oh. exactly right. And I think it's why a lot of, I think it's oddly why there's a lot of anger in the world. I think for a lot of people, they feel, and I'm not defending it, but I just believe this to be true. Yeah. I think a lot of people feel like what's being litigated in essence or legislated or demanded from them is a kind of policing of stuff that they just thought was like part of just the everyday fabric of life. Like I got to watch my P and Q's every minute of every hour of every day. Fuck you. <laughs> Yeah. And, 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 you know, there's some truth to that for sure. Yeah. And, and, and there's, and I get both sides of it, you know, from the point of view of people for whom that language is obviously extremely denigratory, has been used to oppress, has been used to insult. I mean, the phrase to Jew it down, when you look at the long history of the world's relationship to Jewry, it's always been about paint people who are Jewish as thieves, as greedy thieves. Right. So right. that you can ghettoize them, rob them of their civil rights, and punish them. So of course you cannot use that word anymore, even though yeah, that's just, right. You know, and, and and it makes perfect sense. Why but in the world did I waste half an hour talking about Star Trek when we could have just been doing this? I, I don't know. You could always play the interview backwards. I think that's what I'm going to have to do. This is this has been the best. But, uh, but again, that's a pro but the thing is, you'll lose people after seven minutes if you play it backwards. This way, you'll get people sucked in for half an hour of pleasantries before. And then boom, it's like boom. Oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ! Yeah, yeah. See, now that that guy was opinionated. That guy was opinionated. Hey, yeah. we warned him right at the beginning. It says too opinionated. Right? I know. I know. I know. I have friends of mine. It's not my that. fault if they get sucked in. No, and that's why I could never be. I mean, I could never be in politics. It's like, you know, it's like, I mean, that's, I, I also, the one thing that was very interesting is when Trump won, they had all these like, you know, uh, polls about, you know, who do you trust more, Clinton? Who do you think is smarter, Clinton? Who do you think cares more about the average man, Clinton? Yada, yada. Who's more authentic, Trump? Yeah. I was like, it, you know, what's authentic about him is he's authentically coarse. He's authentically mean. He's authentically brutish. He's authentically bigoted. But it is authentic. Yeah. And well, he's also authentically a liar. You know, yeah. Ninety yeah. percent of what he says is a lie, but he's nobody seems to care. He's authentically sociopathic, but it's weird. It's like we would rather have somebody we believe to be sociopathic than somebody we think is secretly sociopathic and is hiding it. Like, he did get he did get booed the other day. I saw that. I saw that he it was he amusing. Created, he created his own fucking animal. I know. It's like yeah. maybe you should get any. He tried to he tried to dial it back. Oh, but yeah, no, I know, I know. Yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> no, I know. I enjoyed that. That was a fun. I think we are all basically. I think in hell, everybody in hell is standing on Rupert Murdoch. I think like when, <laughs> when you know, if you like did a deep dive into hell, at the very bottom, there's Rupert Murdoch, <laughs> who I think is responsible for so much of this this vileness. Yeah. yeah. Well, John, you got to come back. This has been a blast. Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I know yeah. now that I know you don't say no to anybody, I'll ask again. Yeah, absolutely. Have me back. Yeah, I would be, you'd be the first person who's actually come back, which I think might be also somewhat indicative and telling us, you know, it's like everybody says, Oh, that was great, that was great, but nobody ever asked me back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I will <laughs> ask. Okay. Yeah, and I've been doing a lot of red state ones too, which is interesting. It's like, you know, I I I uh these little uh, there you go. I know. So that's why well, I grew up. We were a blue state when I was growing up, but it, hey, it's my, the last I 10 know. years. I know. I remember when Missouri was a blue state and, you yep. know, I mean, no, I know. Well, of course, they all were blue states back, you know, before the Civil Rights Act passed. I mean, you yeah. know, the Democratic Party. I mean, everything flipped. Yeah. And, it's been, you know, it's just been the pro it's been the process of. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not a Democratic Party strategist. I, it is a bitch to try and figure out, like, how do you cobble yeah. together this extraordinarily large, diverse coalition of individual ethnic and, and interest groups that have to a certain yeah. extent defined their mission along separatist lines? Right. It's extremely problematic. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a, a progressive to my bones, but I also sometimes get, you know, extremely frustrated with the classic Democratic firing squad where we form a circle and shoot at each other. Yeah. And it is a series of, of interest groups. And, and there is a point at which you just want to say to everybody in this country, it's like, pull the fucking together for the <laughs> common motherfucking good. You know? Yeah, the last time I remember us all being together, in, at least the way it felt, 
was uh, Mary Lou Retton. 84 Olympics. <laughs> and, and I don't think that counts because that's like, you know, that's just kind of passing social event. I mean, I think you'd right. have to say, what's the last time in American history we have all pulled together in support of a common goal or initiative or a political mm. belief system? I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think you know, the, the, the obvious thing is, is, you know, there was large unanimity about the validity of the Cold War. Yeah, the Cold War is probably it. And I, I, I don't think know what else it would be. I mean, I think you'd have to go back and say that the falling of the Berlin, you know, that guy, uh, 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 Francis Fukuyama, who wrote The End of History, his theory was that with the falling of the um, Berlin Wall, that now we'd reached a point where all the ideological differences of opinion came to an end, and the only possible solution to the world was democracy, democracy, democracy. And the West got so <laughs> fucking self confident and cocky. It's like, hello, globalism ain't going away. Uh, you know, ethno nationalism isn't fucking going away. The will to power isn't going away. <laughs> surprise, surprise. It's just as fucked as it's ever been. Only now we don't have any kind of common enemy or a common yeah. agreement on yeah. uh, climate change should be, in my opinion, the common enemy. It absolutely should be. You know, yeah. but and we're running out of time. I think it's too late. I think the ship It probably is. It probably is. You're old enough that you probably had to hide under your desk at school for uh, not quite know, the bombing thrills. Not no? quite that old. My 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 uh, my wife did actually, uh, but she. Grew I had up, to do that when I was younger. The yeah, she was, she was, she was nuclear attacks. Still. I don't think that. I think that began to go out of fashion in like the. I, I don't know if it lasted beyond Bay of Pigs. I mean, not Bay of Pigs. Uh, um, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, we were doing it in the early seventies here in West Virginia. You were hiding under your desk. Hiding under your desk, we had the uh, nuclear attack drills. Wow, <laughs> West Virginia, baby. Um, yes. I, we're always I, a little behind. Yeah, I was just going to say, no, we weren't. No, we were, by and large, we we had, uh, yeah, that that had not. Uh, I was in, you know. Because you know, hiding under those desks. That is a proven method to survive a nuclear. Oh war. yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That's a uh, whoosh! Thank God I had that desk. I know the yes. kid who doesn't have a desk; he's fucking dead. Yeah, yeah. That's a it's tragic like, story. This, it's happened so many this, times. Yeah, what's that game where you, you know you only have you have nine people in eight chairs? What's that game? Oh yeah, the I don't know what you call uh, uh, yeah. the music game. Musical chairs, pulling the chairs, chairs out. Chairs. I don't yeah. know what the heck it's yeah. called. That's like it's the nuclear war game where it's like the bomb is dropping, but you only musical you chairs. Know. That is terrible. Chairs. Yeah. Yeah. Musical chairs, but only with nuclear bombs. Yeah. So it's like you got 10 desks and nine students, and the bombs are dropping. That's called the West Virginia musical chairs game. <laughs> well, I can't think of a better way to end this podcast. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so, fair enough. so, John, but thank you so much. This has been fun. <laughs> I've had a blast. My is, pleasure. Before I let you go, I'm, I know you're not a huge social media guy. But if somebody wanted to find you on social media, where could they go? Uh, I am. Uh, I will. I will. I will promote two things. Uh, 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 one, I am J Billingsley sixty is Twitter, but yep. also, um, and one of the reasons I do these is uh, if I haven't alienated anybody by the end, uh, <laughs> I am the president of the board of an organization called the Hollywood Food Coalition. Oh, wonderful! Uh, we are h o f o c o dot org, hofoco dot org. If you want to look at our website. And if you're interested in what we're doing and you care to donate, bless you, thank you. We basically serve a hot multi-course meal to all comers seven nights a week. Wonderful. We provide shoes, socks, sleeping bags, tents, ancillary social services. We network with other social service organizations to help get people off the streets if they're experiencing homelessness, get them into mental health programs, yada, yada. And additionally, we rescue... Uh, little under 2 million pounds of food a year, and we share it with approximately 90 other not-for-profits who also have social service programs to help make their food programs more robust. So that's what we do. Um, it's been around for about 35 years, great organization. So if you're at all interested in supporting that work, bless you. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, John, hold on one second. John Billingsley. That was awesome. That was so much better than I knew it was going to be good. So much better than I even expected. He was 
very opinionated. That was that was enjoyable. I, I really uh, really had a blast with him. He uh, very comfortable with himself. Really really enjoyed. It. I've been a fan of his forever, and that did nothing but make me more of a fan. Yeah, such a such a fun, talented guy, and I love the fact that he says he's kind of retired. Really really cool. Although it sounds like he's really busy with uh, the altruism and, and helping others. Uh, uh, so that's that's terrific. So yeah, please, if you can help out, please do so. You know, check out the, check out the website and, and definitely help him out. That was just a blast. And I appreciate you guys hanging in there with me. Those that watch the show regularly, don't take you for granted. I've been hanging in there. You know, I've been fighting some, uh, some health issues, uh, uh, for a while now, and it's uh, it's a struggle. I I love to uh, to laugh, and you know my laugh is uh, restricted. You know I've uh, I work in a, you guys know I work in a hospital during the day, and my immune system sucks anyway. So I tend to come down with some things, and they linger. So I got uh, got pneumonia there a few months back, and now, you know, I'm going through some stuff uh, again that is just it's just uh, frustrating, frustrating. But I'm hanging in there, and I appreciate you hanging in there with me. So hopefully, that didn't uh, didn't sound too bad. John sounded great. Hopefully, I wasn't uh, wasn't too uh, wasn't too terrible. If you haven't done so yet, really appreciate it. if you go to our YouTube channel, Meistercom Pod. Give us a like and subscribe. That would really help us out. You know, we're a father and son podcast. We're doing our best to grow. We have grown further, I think, than either one of us ever would have imagined. And thank you so much for that. But, you know, in, in this business, you got you to gotta keep pushing. So, so please, if, if you can, if you like what you're seeing, please go and like and subscribe. You can also check out our website, MeisterCon.com. We're closing in on 300 episodes, if you can believe it. Audio and video, there's hundreds of interviews. Guarantee you'll find people that you uh, like. If you're geeky like us, you know, Brett and I have shows where we talk about all kinds of geeky stuff. There's a lot of good episodes there that you'll enjoy as well. And Brett does a blog. He's one of the most talented writers I've ever come across. He does a wonderful blog, so definitely check that out. All right. I think that's everything. Thank you guys for hanging in there. That was a fun episode. Until next time, bye, everybody.